Hello, historians. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Prof. J, and I am your history professor. In today's presentation, we're going to be taking a closer look at the ancient Greeks. We'll begin with Greece's recovery from its Dark Age, which was covered in the Unit 2 lecture presentation. We'll also take a look at the period of Greek colonization of the Mediterranean and Black Seas in the 6th and 7th centuries BCE. We'll then move on to look at the Greek polis, or city-state, with a deeper dive into two of the most notable Greek city-states, Athens and Sparta. With Athens, we'll look at how its democratic system of government developed, and with Sparta, we'll look at how its oligarchy, or rule by the few, emerged. We'll also take a bit of a look at Greek warfare, and how the Persian Wars on the one hand and the Peloponnesian War on the other hand were the bookends of the 5th century BCE, a period that is normally known as the Greek Golden Age. Once we're done with the military stuff, we'll get into some cultural developments and look at poetry under Homer, Hesiod, and Sappho, history writing under Herodotus and Thucydides. We'll take a look at Greek drama under Sophocles, as well as Greek comedy. And we'll take an extensive look at Greek philosophy, starting with Thales and some of the earliest Greek philosophers and carrying all the way through to the big three of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Once we get done looking at the cultural developments, we'll end the presentation with a brief look at society in ancient Greece, particularly the role of women and enslavement in Greek society. Without further ado then, it is time for history, so on with the show. Hello historians, in this presentation we'll be looking at the ancient Greeks. Once again, for those taking my class, there's a forum located in our course LMS that accompanies this presentation, so please access that forum now if you haven't already. Now that you're ready to go, let's learn about the Greeks. Recall that in Unit 2's presentation, we saw how at the end of the Bronze Age, the invasions by the Sea People caused the collapse of Mycenaean society and led to a 90% decrease in Greece's population. By the 9th century BCE, Greece was beginning to recover. Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet, abandoning the script used by their Mycenaean predecessors, and had also adopted Phoenician seafaring ways. Population growth also led to the rebirth of towns and cities. As the cities grew in both size and number, they came into contact with one another. At times, smaller communities would agree to combine into a larger unit as a means of survival and mutual benefit. Other times, though, one stronger community would forcibly absorb others. Either way, the process of combination led to the rise of the Greek polis, or city-state. There are two main ways we can understand what a polis was. The first was physical, meaning the polis consisted of the city, as well as the surrounding countryside that produced food for the city. The second is more metaphysical, meaning the polis consisted of the people who lived within its boundaries and served as the hub of political, economic, cultural, and social power. Every polis was a combination of formal institutions and informal rules of behavior, the unwritten norms that guided how people should interact. Most poli, the plural of polis, were organized around a central marketplace, or agora. Surrounding the agora was the urban setting, the place where many people lived, where businesses were, and where buildings for religious and political purposes were built. Outside of the urban setting was the countryside, the farmland that was worked to produce food for those living in the polis. An important step in the development of the polis was the period of Greek colonization, from 700 to 550 BCE roughly. The geography of Greece is very hilly and rugged, meaning there isn't a lot of arable or farmable land for a large population. Additionally, Greek inheritance practices divided property, including land, equally between sons, meaning that as each generation passed, the land was divided into smaller and smaller parcels. Some Greeks who saw the writing on the wall decided to cash out their holdings on the mainland and set sail for new shores. This practice led to the creation of many colonies across the Mediterranean and Black Sea regions. Initially, these colonies weren't much more than trading settlements, 
but as time passed, they grew steadily into their own cities. The colonies also had close ties, financial, cultural, and familial, to Greece, and so kept in close contact and normally established trade with the mother city or metropolis. Colonization also brought Greeks into contact with non-Greeks, who were deemed barbarians because they spoke a non-Greek language that seemed indecipherable. The term barbarian comes from the notion that these other languages sounded to the Greeks like gibberish, bar bar bar. This interaction between Greeks and non-Greeks made the Greeks feel different from and superior to other people around the known world, creating a greater sense of Greek identity. Another important step in the development of the polis was a change in how war was practiced. In the earliest days of the polis, wealthy aristocrats controlled all the powerful government positions. Warfare was based around mounted aristocrats with little infantry support. However, as poli grew, they needed more permanent fighting forces for defense, and larger ones at that. Soon, non-aristocratic members of the polis, who could provide their own armor, became hoplites, or Greek warriors. An individual hoplite was equipped with a 9-foot-long spear as a primary weapon and a sword for backup, a round or oblong shield, a helmet, a breastplate, and greaves, or bronze plates covering the shins and forearms. Hoplites fought in a formation called a phalanx, which was a densely packed group of soldiers, usually 20 men long and 8 to 10 men deep, although this arrangement depended on the situation and the city-state. The success of the phalanx depended on the men working together, something which required a great deal of practice, training, and cooperation. The greater sense of unity fostered by fighting as a phalanx, as well as the expectation that they would fight for the polis, led many troops to call for increased political rights in return for their military service. This theory, known as the Hoplite Revolution, asserts that Greek soldiers argued that if they were expected to fight and possibly die for their polis, it was only fair that they had a say in how that polis was run. Let's pause here and review the main points of this first topic in the presentation. First, the polis, or city-state, grew due to population growth as Greece recovered from its dark age, and due to villages combining into one larger entity. Second, Greek colonization of the eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea regions led to a greater sense of Greek identity, as Greeks encountered non-Greek people who they deemed barbarians. Finally, as infantry troops, or hoplites, were needed to defend city-states, they began to expect political rights in return for putting their lives on the line for their polis. There were hundreds of poli across ancient Greece, the vast majority of which we have no knowledge of. We'll therefore focus on two we do have information on, the two most famous, Athens and Sparta. Athens was initially an aristocracy in which the wealthiest members of the polis controlled all of the political offices. There was an aristocratic council called the Areopagus that voted on measures and nine archons who served as executive officers and were eligible for the Areopagus after their one-year term was over. The increasing chasm between the wealth and power of the rich and the lack of wealth and power of the poor led to dangerous social tensions. So much so that in 594 BCE, a single archon was chosen and given great power to make reforms. Solon then took a number of steps to try and alleviate Athens' problems. He freed every Athenian citizen who was enslaved because of debt, and set aside money to buy back citizens who were enslaved in foreign lands. He also outlawed the practice of debt slavery and using one's body as collateral for debt. He also divided all of Athenian society into four classes based on wealth. The first two classes, the richest, could vote and hold political office. The third class could vote and sit on a new council, but could not hold any political offices, while the poorest in Athens still had no political rights. Solon kept the Areopagus, but supplemented it with a council that anyone in the top three wealth classes could sit on. This council would prepare an agenda for the Areopagus. The system effectively made wealth, and not birth, the prime criterion for political power in Athens. 
Solon's reforms did not solve Athens' problems, however, and social tensions remained high. This led to the tyranny of Pisistratus. Tyranny in ancient Greece was not automatically the bad thing we think of today. For the Greeks, a tyrant was someone who ruled above the law, someone who can impose laws on others they themselves did not need to follow. In fact, the tyranny of Pisistratus actually achieved some good in Athens. He continued the reforms of Solon and spent money building schools and libraries for the people. His sons, though, fell out of favor with the people who overthrew the tyranny and in 508 BCE chose Clisthenes as sole archon, again with the idea that he would fix what ailed Athens. Clisthenes made even more fundamental reforms than did Solon. He made the deme, or village, the basic political unit, much like a precinct is the smallest political unit in America today. He also reorganized Athenian society into 10 tribes, with each tribe including people who lived in Athens, people who lived in the countryside, and people who lived on the coast. Each tribe was therefore a cross-section of Athenian society and would be more representative. He also kept the council set up by Solon, but expanded it from 400 members to 500, with each tribe sending 50 members chosen by lot. The council prepared the agenda for the new citizen assembly, or ecclesia, that would debate and pass laws. The final democratic reformer to look at was one of the most notable figures of Athenian history, and the leader of the city-state during its golden age. Pericles was elected to the office of strategos, or general, many times during his political career, and used his popularity to push through more changes to the political culture of Athens. Pericles allowed even the poorest Athenians to participate in democracy, usually by sitting as jurors for court cases. He also introduced reimbursement payments for those who lost business because they were getting involved in Athens' government. Athens' democracy at home was at such a height that some historians have labeled the period from the 450s BCE to the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War in 431 as the, quote, Age of Pericles. The early history of Athens, then, is one in which problems were resolved by expanding the number of people who could participate in politics, setting up Athens as a democracy, or a state in which the people held power. Although, as we'll see later, the people was pretty narrowly defined. Before we get to the other major Greek city-state, let's take a moment to review the main points of our look at Athens. First, Athens was initially under the control of aristocrats who ruled through a council called the Areopagus. Second, tension between the rich and poor led to the election of Solon to reform Athenian society and government, and he proceeded to make wealth, not birth, the qualifying factor for political power. Third, after a period of tyranny, Clisthenes was chosen to solve Athens' problems, and he laid the foundation for democracy by making the village the basic political unit and creating ten tribes, each a cross-section of political life. Finally, Pericles continued to expand Athenian democracy by allowing the lower classes to sit on juries, but also to receive state pay, which encouraged more participation. Moving on to the other polis, Sparta, we see a city-state moving in pretty much the opposite direction of Athens. Some of you may be familiar with the hyper-masculine movie 300, which depicts the Spartans in a, one of Western history's notable battles. Let's see if we can separate the fact from the fiction. Sparta was located in the Peloponnesus, the Greek peninsula. The first realization we must make is that the Spartans did not write much of anything down. So most of what we know comes from Athenian commenters and historians. So we should be cautious with the source material, as it may not be giving us the most objective, truthful look at Sparta and its people. Politically, Sparta had two kings, possibly as a remnant of its founding from four smaller entities combining with a fifth. Around 720 BCE, Sparta conquered their neighbor Messenia, enslaving its population and creating a large class of helots, or enslaved people. The enslaved people outnumbered the Spartans, so there was always fear of what would happen should those enslaved people revolt against their masters. That fear led Sparta to reorganize itself as a military power focused on training, discipline, and obedience. 
The reforms Sparta underwent are usually attributed to the lawgiver Lycurgus, though some historians doubt that he existed in real life. The new Spartan ethos began at birth, when every newborn was inspected by a state official. Infants deemed too small, sickly, or with obvious physical deformities were left to die of exposure to the elements, as the Spartans refused to allow any supposed weakness into their society. At the age of seven, boys were taken from their families and put into military-style barracks to live and train with other boys. This training was brutal. Boys were intentionally starved to understand and overcome the pain of hunger. Strict discipline was imposed, with harsh punishments for disobedience and weakness. Every boy was given a farm that was worked by helots, and it was expected that the boy would sneak out of the barracks, reach their farm, steal food, and return without being caught. This taught them stealth, and punishment was for getting caught, not for stealing food. At age 20, Spartan men could marry, but they had to remain in the barracks until age 30, when they could finally take possession of their farm as full Spartan citizens. If a Spartan man wanted to spend time with his wife, just as with the food, he had to sneak out of the barracks, reach her, and return without getting caught. Spartan men remained in the army until age 60. In addition to the two kings, Sparta was ruled by a council of 28 elders called the Jerusia, which prepared the agenda for the assembly of full Spartan males to vote on proposals. There was no open discussion or debate as in Athens. There was simply a yes or no vote. There were also five ephors responsible for overseeing the education system. This meant that Sparta was ruled by 35 men, essentially, with others having a yes or no vote on proposed legislation. Quite the difference from Athens, which will have tens of thousands of men eligible for office at the height of its democracy. Spartan society was very insular, very rigid. They shunned innovation in favor of tradition. Their entire culture was geared for war, usually against their own enslaved people. The Spartans even went so far as to officially declare war on their own helots every year as a means of legalizing their murder. In many ways, they were the polar opposite of Athens, but in some ways, as we'll see later, they were actually a bit more open. Before we move on, let's take some time to review the main points of our look at Sparta. First, Sparta was reorganized by the semi-legendary figure Lycurgus to be militaristic in order to protect itself against the large number of helots. Second, the Spartan educational system was brutal, designed to purge Spartan youth of any weaknesses and ensure future warriors could endure any hardship. Finally, Sparta was an oligarchy, ruled by essentially 35 men who controlled all the political power with male citizens having only a yes or no vote and no ability to discuss legislation. Just as changes in warfare had a dramatic effect on the development of the polis, the golden age of ancient Greece, the one nearly everyone thinks about when they hear the phrase ancient Greece, was bookended by two major wars. One that brought Greece, specifically Athens, to its zenith, and one that brought most of Greece to its knees. The Persian Wars began in modern-day Turkey, in a region then called Ionia. Greek city-states had been established here even before the Persians came calling, and not everyone was happy about being under Persian rule. In 499 BCE, Poli in Ionia began a five-year-long revolt against the empire, and received aid from mainland Greece, specifically Athens. The Greeks burned the regional capital at Sardis, but then Athens, feeling good about helping fellow Greeks, simply left, leaving the Ionian Greeks to face the Persian wrath alone. After the Ionian Greeks were punished, Persian Emperor Darius planned an invasion of Greece to teach Athens a lesson. In 490 BCE, he launched his fleet from Turkey, but in a surprising turn of events, the Persian forces were defeated at the Battle of Marathon by the Greek general Miltiades, who allowed the Persians to advance against the center of the Greek force, while strong wings on either end turned toward the Persians and trapped them. Over 6,000 Persians were killed in this battle, while the Greeks lost barely 100. It was a phenomenal victory, but one the Greeks knew would not mark the end of the Persian threat. Darius died in 486 BCE and was succeeded by Xerxes, 
who after establishing his control of the Empire, set his sights on revenge for Marathon. In 480 BCE, another, much more massive Persian assault was launched, this time from both land and sea. The Greek strategy was to buy time by holding off the Persian land force at the important choke point of Thermopylae. A force of 300 Spartans, aided by other Greeks, held off the Persians for three days until a traitor showed the Persians an old goat path that would take them around the Greeks. Once the Spartans realized what was happening, their leader and king, Leonidas, sent the other Greeks home, telling him to warn everyone that Persians would soon be coming. The Spartans continued to fight and were killed to the last man, while on the seas the Athenians, led by Themistocles, attack and sank a number of Persian ships, weakening their forces. Once the Persians had gotten through the choke point, they made for Athens. Themistocles had the entire population evacuated to the nearby island of Salamis before the Persians arrived. Athens was sacked and set ablaze, but in the naval battle off the coast, the tight space prevented the Persians from maneuvering, and many more ships were sunk by the Greek fleet. Xerxes traveled back to Persia, but left a force in Greece to continue the war. The next year, 479 BCE, the Persians were decisively defeated on the plains outside the city of Plataea, putting an end to the Persian Wars and completing one of the greatest upsets in Western history. Greece, and especially Athens, would use the victory against Persia and the immense confidence that came with it to embark on stunning new developments in art, drama, architecture, and philosophy. But we'll get to those in a bit. The century dominated by the Greeks, the 5th century BCE, would come to a catastrophic end with another war, this one between Athens and Sparta. After the Persian Wars, Athens had formed the Delian League with a number of other Greek city-states. The purpose of the League was to provide mutual defense in case of another Persian attack. Larger poli contributed money as well as resources for ships, while smaller poli contributed what money and personnel they could. Things began to unravel, though, as Athens first moved the League treasury from the island of Delos to Athens itself and began using the money to glorify Athens rather than for the express purpose of being ready for another invasion. Any city-state that wanted to remove itself from the League was attacked by Athens, had its walls torn down and much of its city burned, before being forced to pay for the repairs. The Delian League had become the agent of Athenian imperialism. Sparta, meanwhile, formed its own defensive league, the Peloponnesian League, named after the peninsula where Sparta was situated. A few other Greek city-states, worried about Athens expanding and threatening them, joined with Sparta. Tension between the two leagues boiled over in 431 BCE, when war broke out, and would last for the next 27 years. Initially, the strategy was the same for each side. Starve the other into surrender. The Spartans, with the most fearsome land-based army in Greece, rampaged through Athenian territory, burning crops, tearing down villages, and denying Athens resources. The Athenians, safe behind walls too thick and tall for the Spartans to break, imported food using their superior navy. They also used that navy to blockade Sparta's ports, and they tried to spark a helot rebellion to distract the Spartans. Two years into the war, a vicious plague, likely Typhus, struck Athens, killing Pericles in addition to thousands of Athenian citizens and soldiers. Athens would never recover, despite staying in the war for the next 25 years. Eventually, the Spartans would turn to an old adversary, the Persians, for money and a navy to challenge Athenian supremacy on the seas. After some initial losses, they finally defeated the Athenians and in 404 BCE, marched into Athens as conquerors. Athens' walls were torn down and its democracy was ended, replaced by a group of 30 anti-democratic leaders called the 30 Tyrants. After eight months, the Tyrants were overthrown and democracy re-established. However, Athens was a shadow of its former self. Sparta, itself reeling from the war and worried as ever about a helot revolt, retreated home rather than take up leadership of all Greece. Weakened and leaderless, 
Greece would be easy pickings for a pair of conquerors to the north. It's time for a short break and review of the main points of our section on the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars. First, the Persian Wars began when Athens aided the Ionian Greeks in their revolt against Persia. Second, the Athenians scored a major victory against Persia at Marathon, and the Greeks secured a final victory over the Persian forces at Plataea in 479 BCE. Third, near the end of the 5th century BCE, Athens had become an empire, using Delian League money to beautify itself and forcing allies to stay in the alliance. Fourth, both Sparta and Athens had the same overall strategy, but neither could gain an advantage, despite Athens being hit with a plague that killed Pericles. Finally, after receiving a navy from Persia, Sparta finally defeated Athens, though both sides were so depleted that the Golden Age of Greece came to an end. Such is the political tale of Athens and Sparta. Now it's time to move on to other aspects of Greek history. I mentioned earlier how Athens reached its zenith during the decades between the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars, both in terms of political clout and cultural development. Let's take a look at some of those cultural developments and the way Greek religion and myth influenced them. We'll start with poetry. The earliest Greek poets, men like Homer and Hesiod, were epic poets, spinning tales of gods and heroes. Homer's works focused on famous heroes like Odysseus, Hector, and Ajax during the Trojan War, and the adventures of Odysseus on his decade-long journey home. Hesiod, meanwhile, explored the origins of the world, writing about golden ages of gods, monsters, and heroes. Lyric poetry, that play to the accompaniment of a stringed musical instrument called a lyre, was the next form of poetry to emerge. The best examples of lyric poetry come from one of the most well-renowned poets in Western history, the poet Sappho. Her poems focus on various themes like love, sex, war, beauty, and loss. A keen observer of humanity, her poetry is filled with and invokes intense emotion. You can also see numerous references to gods, goddesses, and mythical figures in many of her poems. Perhaps the best-known Greek art was drama, especially tragedy. Plays were put on during major religious festivals, like those celebrating the goddess Athena or the god Dionysus. Tragedies often dealt with the effects of hubris, or human overconfidence in their ability to control their own lives. One terrific example of this is from Sophocles, the play Oedipus Rex, centering on the title character Oedipus, who is fated to murder his own father and marry his own mother. Oedipus tries to avoid the fate the gods had assigned to him, but in the end he only fulfills his destiny, but it comes with much greater pain. This play, and others like it, is meant to remind us that the gods are the ones truly in control, and how pointless it is to fight their will. Tragedies also reflected society and current issues, such as the nature of justice, the effects of abusing power, and the needs of the individual versus the needs of the state. Tragedies weren't the only plays put on, however. Comedies of the day were satires, meant to mock people, institutions, and situations. For example, the playwright Aristophanes wrote Lysistrata to mock the fighting of the Peloponnesian War. In the play, the women of Athens put on a sex strike, refusing to sleep with their men until they agreed to stop fighting the pointless war. The popularity of comic plays prevented official retaliation, allowing them to serve as important vehicles for expressing displeasure with the way things went. We also see advances in the realm of history, which we can all agree is the best subject ever. Herodotus was the first to tell a tale systematically and methodically. He used direct witnesses to tell a story as accurately as possible. His most famous work, the Persian Wars, also began to challenge Greek views by portraying the relatives of Persian soldiers killed at the Battle of Marathon, grieving and expressing emotions just like Greeks, suggesting that perhaps non-Greeks weren't as barbaric as they were normally thought to be. Thucydides was even more meticulous about his sources than Herodotus, and included only direct eyewitness testimony, contemporary sources, and information he could personally verify. 
His main work, The History of the Peloponnesian War, explored a deeper meaning to the conflict. According to Thucydides, the war was really about different conceptions of freedom. For the Athenians, freedom meant being able to run their city-state and their empire however they wanted, with no interference from anyone else. For the Spartans, freedom meant carrying on their traditions and ways of life, a freedom that was potentially threatened by Athenian expansion. Both historians also minimized the role of the gods in human affairs, instead centering human actions as the main catalysts for change. In terms of architecture, temples to the pantheon of Greek gods were often the largest and most well-adorned cities in a Greek polis. Temples usually contained statues of the gods for people to give offerings and prayers to, and were used to not only honor the gods, but also to show off the wealth and power of the city-state in question. Before we get to the final cultural development, that being philosophy, let's take a moment to review the main points of the previous section. First, poetry in ancient Greece consisted of heroic epics from men like Homer and Hesiod, as well as lyric poetry from poets like Sappho that explored the concepts of beauty, love, war, and others. Second, Greek drama took the form of tragedies, such as Oedipus Rex, which illustrates the idea that the gods are in control and it's pointless to fight their will, as well as comedies that could poke fun at politicians and situations. Finally, Herodotus and Thucydides developed the discipline of history by searching for credible eyewitnesses and verifiable information, and placed emphasis on human actions rather than divine influence. Perhaps the most notable cultural development from ancient Greece, however, is philosophy. The first Greek philosophers came from the city-state of Miletus in Turkey. This polis was at a trading crossroads between Greece and the Persian Empire, and was therefore a cosmopolitan city, wherein one would hear numerous languages, see a wide variety of products from the known world, and crucially be exposed to a range of ideas. Thales and his followers were the first to systematically study cause and effect relationships, and began to theorize that there was an underlying rational order to the entire world that kept everything running smoothly together. Thales and others, like Anaximander, theorize that as time progresses, things in the world get more complicated. This led to the notion that if we were able to travel backwards through time, things would get less complicated until we came to the single point at which the entire universe began. Hmm. Everything in the universe beginning from a single point in the far, far, far distant past. Why does that sound so familiar? These first philosophers were the first in the West to view the changing nature of the world as a problem that could be solved by human beings using rational thought and reason. The philosopher Xenophanes even looked critically at religious belief. He observed that different groups of people believed their gods looked just like them. Greek people portrayed their gods as looking just like Greeks, while African people portrayed their gods looking like Africans. He even postulated that if cows could imagine gods, they'd probably look like cows. This led Xenophanes to the conclusion that gods don't really make people, but rather people make their gods. Next up are two groups of philosophers usually lumped together as the, quote, pre-Socratics, because they honed their ideas prior to the arrival of the famous Socrates. The Pythagoreans focused on the study of math and music, because they believed it was through understanding abstract concepts that humans could better grasp the world around us. The Sophists were traveling teachers who sold knowledge. Unlike the Pythagoreans, Sophists focused on the more practical applications of thought, and focused on teaching rhetoric, or the art of persuasive speaking. Because they often taught how to argue all sides of a debate, they were seen by many as not having any beliefs themselves and were often charged with teaching people how to manipulate others for their own gain. Additionally, some sophists were relativists, meaning they believed things like morality, justice, and ethical behavior were always dependent on the individual person and the specific situation they were in. 
For these thinkers, there were no hard and fast rules of morality or behavior, which often got them into trouble with authorities who wanted to enforce a city-state's rules. When most people talk of Greek philosophy, though, they bring up the big three. Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. These three men are perhaps the most famous and influential philosophers of the Western world. Socrates trained as a stonemason and served in the Athenian army, and was curious about the world and the people in it. He developed a question and answer technique now known as the Socratic method, by which he sought to bring the people he spoke with to knowledge. Socrates felt the truth of the world could only be achieved through precisely defining important concepts like justice, ethics, and morality. He wanted his companions to rigorously interrogate their assumptions about life because he believed that was the best way to live a good life. Socrates never wrote anything down. He believed philosophy should be spoken and discussed, not hidden away in books. What we know of Socrates comes from others, both contemporary and those that came after, most notably his student Plato. Plato wrote a number of dialogues or discussions between multiple characters. He often used to teach your Socrates as the main character, and many scholars feel in Plato's earliest dialogues, he's telling us more about what Socrates believed than what he himself believed. The dialogue served as examples of the Socratic method in action, as Socrates poses what at first seems like a simple question, then proceeds to pick apart every statement his companions utter. Plato believed that the world we see around us isn't real, but rather constitutes a series of shadows of the perfect versions of those objects, the ideal forms. It's quite a trippy concept and one that's difficult to wrap your mind around. Let's use a simple example to try and explain it. Take, for instance, an apple. There are different types of apples that exist in the world. Red Delicious, Granny Smith, Cortland, Gala, Arkansas Black, and still others. What is it about all of these different types of apples that makes them all apples? What is the quality or qualities that make all apples such, despite the variation between them? Please keep in mind that the scientific information we have available to us today about things like apples wasn't available to Plato and other ancient philosophers. Plato answered that there is a realm that existed, whether this is another dimension or a mental realm accessible to the human mind, he does not specify, where the most perfect version of an apple exists. And every apple that we see in the world around us is an imperfect copy of the perfect form of apple. All of those different types of apples that you could get from a store or an orchard aren't really real according to Plato, they're merely shadows of the ideal form of apple, which to him is the only truly real apple. I know all of this makes it sound like Plato and I are on some seriously hardcore drugs, but this theory has serious implications. For Plato, in order to live a good, or moral, or just life, you had to understand what those terms meant, and you could only do that by understanding the forms of those ideas. The form of justice, the form of the good, the form of morality, and so on. If you could not comprehend the forms of those high-minded ideals, you could not live a good, moral, and just life. This idea of the ideal forms had political ramifications in this world as well. Plato was not a fan of democracy. His teacher Socrates had been put on trial by democratic Athens for supposedly corrupting the youth and creating his own gods. He was convicted and forced to drink poison, and Plato never forgave Athens and its democracy for that action. Plato believed the best leaders were those who could comprehend the ideal forms, and thus understand what true justice, true good, meant. Most people could not or would not understand the forms, so most people were not equipped to lead, according to Plato. He envisioned a group of philosopher kings as the best men to run a city-state, men who spent years studying numerous subjects and thinking deeply about the world, and who came to an understanding of the forms, an understanding they would use to effectively run their polis. The final member of the Big Three was Plato's student, Aristotle. 
like his teacher, Aristotle believed in the existence of the ideal forms. But he argued the forms were in the actual physical objects. Therefore, contrary to his teacher, Aristotle believed we can understand reality by close examination of the physical world around us because it was real. Rather than the numerous kinds of apples all being imperfect shadows of the ideal form of apple, Aristotle wrote that the form of apple was part of all the versions of apple, so they all contain the form of apple. The physical objects of the world contain the certain characteristic that makes them what they are. Aristotle's writings aren't as easy to understand as Plato's. Aristotle's works take the form of lecture notes that were later compiled together into comprehensive looks at various subjects, like physics. Plato's works, by contrast, are much more polished and flow much more smoothly and are therefore easier to read and digest. Aristotle also wasn't a fan of democracy because he felt it was based on the flawed idea of human equality. Aristotle believed humans were naturally unequal and that inequality carried on throughout their lives. This means that some people were more naturally fit to lead and others more naturally fit to follow. He even went so far as to write about how slavery is a natural aspect of human societies because some humans were simply fit to be enslaved and others to be masters. He argued that due to the nature of human inequality, different political arrangements fit different groups of people. For instance, democracy was possible only in small, homogeneous communities, while larger, more diverse ones required a monarchy in order to function smoothly. That's quite a lot of heavy ideas, so let's take a short break and review the main points of the philosophy material we just covered. First, Thales and Anaximander studied cause and effect relationships, while Xenophanes took a critical look at religion. Second, the Pythagoreans believed in the power of mathematics, while sophists were traveling teachers instructing students in rhetoric, but were generally not well thought of. Third, Socrates developed a question and answer technique to get people to interrogate their own assumptions about the world, but was put to death by Athens. Fourth, Plato developed his theory of the forms to explain what reality was and argued only philosopher kings should rule. Finally, Aristotle believed the world we see around us was real, that everyday objects contained the forms Plato spoke of, and that certain types of governments fit different types of people. There's only one aspect of Greek history we haven't covered as yet, and that deals with social organization. The first thing to discuss about Greek society is that in the early centuries, as we've already seen and much like other cultures we've discussed, many poli were dominated by aristocrats. These wealthy families not only monopolized all of the political positions, but they also competed against each other for power, and some of their habits and attitudes will be carried on by various city-states like Sparta. One of the legacies of this aristocratic culture were symposia, which were essentially drinking parties that were for aristocrats only. No non-aristocrats were allowed. One purpose of these gatherings was for young aristocrats to network and make connections that would aid their political careers. Another was for aristocrats to celebrate their status and power. Yet another was possibly for informal alliances and deals to be made that couldn't be made otherwise. Symposia, therefore, served to help grease the wheels of politics in the polis. At these parties, the only women who were allowed in were the hetera, the high-class escorts that provided witty banter, storytelling, songs, and sexual intercourse with the men in attendance. This brings us to the role of women in ancient Greece. In a paradoxical development, as many city-states expanded rights for men, rights for women were reduced. A woman's job in Greece was to produce and raise children especially boys that could be groomed for service in the army. Women had no political rights in nearly all city-states, and in most it was taboo for a married woman to even be seen by any man other than her husband. Therefore, many Greek women were restricted to the home quite literally. Public spaces were nearly exclusively reserved for men, with few exceptions. 
Greek society was therefore more restrictive towards women than other societies we've studied, as none of them prevented women from entering public spaces, and the Code of Hammurabi gave women certain protections in society that they did not seem to get in ancient Greece. Even within the home, women were expected to retreat to private areas when guests visited. They weren't supposed to be idle, however. When not focusing on their children, women were to spend their time weaving cloth. The ideal of Greek womanhood was provided by Penelope, the wife of Odysseus, who remained loyal to her husband, even though he did not return the favor, and spent much of her time waiting patiently for his return. As we've seen with Symposia, and with other cultures we've studied, such as Egypt, sexual equality did not exist in ancient Greece. Men were allowed to have sexual relations with women other than their wives, while women had to save themselves for their husbands in order to produce legitimate children who would inherit property and citizenship. Homosexual relations were also allowed in the appropriate context, usually a young male just starting out in the world being taken as a lover by an older, more experienced man who would be a mentor, showing his younger companion the political and social norms of their polis and how to get things done. Homosexuality was not something accepted in other ancient societies, making Greece unique in its acceptance in any context. Despite its reputation for aggressive masculinity, Sparta was actually more progressive when it came to women's rights than places like Athens. In Sparta, as we've seen, boys were taken from their families at age 7 and placed into military barracks. They were given a farm worked by helots. At age 20, they could marry, but still had to live in the barracks. Who do you think managed the farm and property while the men were in the barracks training and at war? Spartan women did. Spartan women also received more education, especially physical education, than other Greek women, because it was believed that two physically fit and strong parents would give birth to strong children. Somewhat ironically then, the city-state ran as an oligarchy and known for its harsh discipline and reluctance to change, allowed women to do more in society than did the city-state known for democracy and culture. Good for you, Sparta. Good for you. Both Sparta and Athens, however, built their city-states largely on the backs of enslaved labor, which was typical of many societies in the ancient world, as we now know. We've already seen how in Sparta, everything about their warlike society was directed toward warding off a potential uprising of their helots. It was possible for Spartan males to go through the education and training system because there were enslaved people around to work the farm while young Spartans trained in barracks and went off to war. In Athens, men who had political rights needed free time in order to participate, and that free time was provided by enslaved labor. At its height, Athens had somewhere between 30,000 and 60,000 men who were eligible for political participation, while also having 80,000 enslaved people. Athenian freedom, therefore, was intimately tied to a large population that was decidedly not free. Enslaved people were not owned in huge numbers in ancient Greece. Many people, not just the wealthy, owned enslaved people, and the vast majority owned one or two, usually as domestic servants. Enslaved people came primarily as prisoners of war, but could also be people kidnapped by pirates on the seas or could be born into the condition. Some enslaved people became so close to their owners that they were considered as part of the family. Some owners were quite gentle in their treatment of enslaved people. However, we should not let that distract us from the fact that the people they were treating gently were, you know, enslaved and could legally be treated much more viciously if their owner was so inclined. It's time for our final review of this presentation, so let's examine the main points of our look at Greek society. First, many Greek city-states were dominated by aristocrats, whose power was demonstrated through symposia that non-aristocrats were not allowed into. Second, women were greatly restricted in Greek society, not being allowed into many public spaces and expected to save themselves for their husbands, husbands who could have sex with other women. Ironically though, Sparta gave their women more rights and responsibilities than most other city-states, including Athens. Lastly, slavery was an integral part of ancient Greek life, 
as men in both Athens and Sparta needed leisure time to pursue either politics or war, and that leisure time was provided by enslaved labor. That does it for Unit 3 on Ancient Greece. In this lesson, we've examined how democracy and oligarchy arose in Athens and Sparta. We've looked at how the Greek arts were influenced by religion and myth. We've investigated how philosophy changed the way people interact with and understand the world. And finally, we've explored how the social organization of the Greeks was similar to and different from other cultures we've studied. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below or send me an email. Additionally, Here's a list of books you can check out if you'd like to know more information about the topics covered in today's lesson. As always, please don't let the comment section turn into a raging dumpster fire. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you all again in the next video.